And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to CXC 2020. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am the interim executive director of CartoonCrossroadsColumbus.org. And uh, very excited about this panel. May you draw in interesting times, uh, political cartooning in 2020. Oh, I know there's a lot to talk about here. So I'm going to get out of the way as soon as possible. But first, I want to thank some people who make this show possible. You may have noticed we did not charge admission for you to watch this today. And that is because CXC is a 5013C nonprofit organization who relies heavily on donors and sponsors like the Ohio Arts, Ohio Arts Council, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, White Castle, the Columbus Foundation, Abel and Fiesel. We thank them for their support. Now, Real quick, for those of you in the Zoom webinar, if you've never been to a Zoom webinar, this is how it works. Um, look, there's the sponsors again. Uh, this is a presentation followed by Q&A. You have been automatically muted by the host, that's me, and your video is off. So you're going to be interacting with the panelists via text. I'll tell you how in just a moment. And I should say, this presentation is being recorded and it is being simulcast to our Facebook stream, YouTube uh, page, and uh, the CXC Twitch. So how do you participate then? Well, you may have noticed at the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse over it, there is a chat button there. You can hit that to open up a chat and that chats with the panelists and everybody. So you can comment and you can ask questions there, but it will be seen by everybody else. And then there's a and a button. And this is for people who may want to preserve a little bit of privacy. Like, let's say you want to ask a question, but you really don't not necessarily want to be identified by the panel when the question is addressed. So you can click on the Q&A button. This pops up and you have the option to send anonymously even if you don't send anonymously, it will not appear in the chat. Only the panelists will see it. So with that, I will get out of the way and I would like to introduce everybody to Cal. Take it away, Cal. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. And I welcome everybody from wherever you are to this uh, great panel about editorial cartooning in the crazy year of 2020. And we have a, an amazing collection of uh, quality cartoonists and high quality, high character individuals, uh, eclectic and diverse and, and a terrific, um, um, amazing collection of cartoons we're gonna be sharing with you today. So joining me is um, a, car a cartoonist. I wanna go around the table here just to say hi to everybody. Uh, we're gonna start on my, over, over in this direction. We got uh, Dave Brown, say hi to everyone, Dave. Hey guys. Great to be with you. Good to see you, Cal. Good to be oh, with you, man. This is great. And then we have an over in, in this direction, we're going to have uh, uh, Angela Lopez. Angela, say hi to everyone. Hi. Welcome, and thank you for for joining us. That's it. Down on this, this side, over down here, um, <laughs> Pat Bagley from Salt Lake. Hey, Pat. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. And we have Jen Sorensen, who's just down there. Jen, how are you doing? Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And then Eric, Eric, can you say Eric Garcia is down in my, down, down under that. I feel like a musical square here. Eric, say hi. Hello, honored to share space with everyone. So, um, so and I'm Cal Calher. I'm the editorial cartoonist for The Economist magazine. Uh, cartoonist also for The Baltimore Sun and for CounterPoint, which is an online um, editorial cartoon newsletter. And I'm gonna do bios of each of the people here and then allow each of them to show um, four of their uh, cartoons from this year. I've asked them also to choose one cartoon of another individual who they think is doing interesting and creative work in this crazy year. Um, then we're gonna open the floor. We're gonna first have a little conversations amongst ourselves, talking with the cartoonist. Then after we see everybody's work, we're gonna have a group conversation that's gonna include you. So please, question and answers, join into the, to the mix. Uh, we're going to have an awful lot of fun. And believe me, believe me, we have a lot to talk about. You remember that 2020 started off really quietly with a uh, presidential impeachment and nearly a war with Iran. And since then, we've had, you know, um, marches for racial justice. We've had a pandemic on top of a completely lunatic presidential campaign. And it's been a time been, you know, rich and ripe for uh, satirists, cartoonists, and commentators, but also surprisingly challenging. So what I've asked each of these guys to submit their cartoons. And first, I'm going to start with you, Jen, if you don't mind. I'm going to right. um, get to my screen. I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint with your cartoons. And let me see if I can do this properly. I've 
see if we figure out how to do this. And this thing. And let's see. So Jen, um, I'm going to ask you, Jen, if you don't mind to re read your cartoons uh, as we move forward here. Sure thing. So uh, this is a fairly recent one called Burbs of Chaos. Uh, and here we go. America's suburbs and exurbs are home to many extremists. We see a guy reading the violent white supremacist gazette. Is your dog Boogaloo ready? And how to heighten your hell? <laughs> <laughs> These areas also breed radical politicians. Time to take out the global cabal of Satan worshiping pedophiles. <laughs> Far right mobs with un-American values bring mayhem to our cities and universities. Urbanites beware, they're coming for your way of life. These guys give me the creeps. And that's so, what it looked like, right? That's, yeah, that's the whole cartoon. And, um, you know, this is clearly a reversal since so much of what we hear in the media these days is kind of a reversal of reality. Um, in fact, you know, there's a lot of uh, rhetoric coming from the right about, you know, how you know, violent mobs from the cities are going to invade the suburbs and, um, you know, it seems to be uh, scaring a lot of people and it seems to be uh, believed by a lot of people when in fact, I, I think the bigger threat is in fact some of these militias and, and you know, like the Proud Boys storming into our cities and making, uh, making people feel pretty uncomfortable there. So, um, and of course we have the QAnon politician uh, from Georgia up there in the uh, upper right hand corner. Uh, I guess there's a number of those out there as well, that may be running our country soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one's called Faces of the Maskless. Uh, the first kind is oblivious, not really thinking about it, tendency to form gaggles. <laughs> the politicizer, my nostrils are free and will stand their ground. <laughs> the conspiracist, Masks are a tool of the Illuminati to keep us compliant for the new world order. The misguided masculinist. Man strong, not need mask like woman. <laughs> the armchair epidemiologist. Through my own extensive internet research, I've learned that all I need to be safe is this tea made from mule wort. The victim. At least he doesn't have to wear a mask. <laughs> so yeah, this is based on a, a few examples that I've encountered in real life, particularly the oblivious. Uh, I was at a grocery store once and uh, there, you know, just this horde of, of kids just kept crowding me while I was at the checkout line. And like, as I kept inching away, the horde kept getting closer and closer and, uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> I'm sure we can all, we've all experienced some of these people at one point or another. This one's called School Lunches of the Future. The Trump administration has proposed undoing Michelle Obama's healthy school lunch program. Kids should eat like real Americans, not soy boys. <laughs> 2022, vegetables outlawed, lunch policy written by Big Donut. You get a whole bowl and a dunker dog. Mm. 2024, wartime measures lead to defunding public schools, austerity lunches. And we get a brick of grade E meat slurry made from downer cows raised in fracking wastewater. Mm. 2026, after the events, almost healthy again. Foraged roots and edible fungus, along with slightly radioactive squirrel thighs. So this is the kind of cartoon I really like to do in that it's not necessarily about um, politicians and headline news, but it's, you know, it's about these very important stories that are happening just uh, under the radar. And, you know, you know they, they get overlooked these days because there's always just a, you know, crazy uh, you know, tsunami of, of headlines. But, um, you know, this is the stuff that's actually happening and actually affecting people's lives. Now, here I'm going to share a cartoon by someone else. Uh, this is by a cartoonist named D.L. Weeks, who 
is, I guess, you know, I, I learned about her on Twitter. We follow each other on Twitter. And uh, I saw that she was doing this thing called the Utah COVID Memorial. And it's not, you know, exactly a political cartoon per se, but I think it really speaks to the power of cartooning to, to make a, a point. And she, what she's doing is drawing portraits of, uh, you know, lots of different people in Utah who have died from COVID. And if you go to the site, you can click through each image and it links to their obituary. And it's, I think it's very touching and, and very moving. And I, you know, I'm kind of surprised it hasn't gotten more, more coverage. Well, first of all, guys, come on, give it up for Jen, all right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good job, Jen. Good job. Well, Thanks, you know, Kel. one of the interesting things um, you know, about uh, the cartooning world of which people who attend something like uh, uh, Cartoon Crossroads, you see a whole variety of different styles and approaches. And um, in the editorial cartoon world, the commentary world that, that we all kind of exist in, there's many people who do daily cartoons firing on deadlines. And what's so great about yours, Jen, is, is that you're a, a big picture kind of character. You're looking at lots of the interesting angles in some society. I'm, I'm just curious, one question that all cartoonists get asked a lot, but as a cartoonist, I'm dying to ask you this question is, where do you get your ideas from? I mean, how do they, <laughs> I mean, what Not is that it question. that you're searching for <laughs> in, 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 when, you, when you see world, the news breaking? Right, right. Um, well, in general, I try to go with whatever it is Real, is really getting under my skin that week. Like just what moves me on an emotional level? Because I find if you can tap into that anger or you know whatever it is that you're really feeling, uh, you're gonna do a better cartoon about it. Now, I have, uh, there are weeks when I'd like to do a cartoon about a particular topic, but I don't have any good ideas on that topic. And so, you know, <laughs> I wind up doing something else. But from, yeah, for me, it's like, and especially if I can find that story that people, that I feel is really important that people aren't talking about, that really appeals mm. to me. That's interesting. Anybody else have uh, any questions? Okay, can I jump in here about the cartoonist that you chose is the not your cartoon, Deal Weeks. Right, right. <laughs> okay, she's on Twitter and she goes by the, the handle Fluffalo Rome, I think. Yes. But she's an absolutely great follow. And she, besides doing that Utah Memorial, uh, she does political cartoons and she's great. She's, she's wonderful. So mm -hmm. great. Good, great. Good choice, by the way. Then yeah. I, I, Thanks. I love your work and I think it's great to bring some of these issues uh, in social commentary <clears throat> to light. And I, I, and I love your artwork and your caricatures and uh, great job. Oh, thanks so much, David. I appreciate it. Great, well, well let's um, move on. Next up is Angela, Angela Lopez. Okay, so Angela, let me, let me read uh, a little short bio here. Angela Lopez has been doing editorial cartoons since 2008. He first was published in the Tri-City Voice, a community newspaper that covers the east part of the San Francisco Bay Area. Since 2012, he's been a regular editorial cartoonist for the Philippine News Today, a Filipino American community newspaper circulating in the San Francisco Bay Area. So now I'm gonna go back to the share screen and pull up your work, Angelo. Let's see <laughs> if we can make this work this time again. This would be really amazing if I can, there we go. Fire away. Okay. Um, okay, I'm unmuted. So yeah, so um, I, I did this um, cartoon recently, the, uh, uh, the Philippine legislator passed an anti-terror law and uh, a lot of groups, especially the Catholic Church, have been petitioning against this anti-terror law because um, uh, the you know it's a law where they they try to get um, jail people for terrorism, but their definition of terrorism is so vague that anybody could be arrested for this anti-terrorism law, and they're already having problems um, in the Philippines with the Duterte government. Um, um, attacking people who criticize them. So people, lawyers, um, but especially the Catholic Church um, are trying to um, petition the government to, to get rid of this anti-terror law. So, And this is just another one where uh, Duterte, uh, one of the things about Duterte for the past few um, years, you know, since the very beginning, he's been pushing for the police to... Um, to use extrajudicial killings to try to um, 
to, um, you know, fight against this drug war and stuff. And so around 27,000 people um, have died so far from this um, drug war. And, uh, and most of those people were not, um, um, you know, they didn't have trial. They were just shot and killed and stuff. And I think two thirds of the people who got shot and killed were actually shot and killed by vigilantes, not even by police. So, um, you know, and I did this uh, collage of skulls because I think for the past four years, I've been drawing skulls and I've been, I'm kind of getting tired of drawing skulls. So I just started collaging skulls just to make it a little easier for me. Yeah, and as well as, um, as um, um, you know, killing people and stuff. Um, uh, Duterte has been attacking the press. And so um, the Philippines, I think it's one of the top four most dangerous countries in the world for journalists right now. So, um, you know, one of the top, uh, actually the top, uh, you know, news media in the Philippines, ABS-CBN, just got its um, franchise taken away by the a legislature. And the legislature is pretty much dominated by supporters of Duterte. Um, uh, top journalist from the uh, from the news media Rappler. Her name is Maria Ressa. She just got uh, convicted of a of a cyber libel law that didn't even exist when she supposedly broke the law. And um, these other ones, Balat Lot and uh, the Catholic news media, those are um, have also struggled, um, you know to get their, um, they've been criticized by the Duterte government and by Duterte himself. He's threatened to, um, uh, to anybody who criticizes him, you know, go ahead and kill. So it's, it's not been good. Yeah. Oh, um, and this is a, a cartoonist that I really like. Um, his name is Andy Singer. Um, Andy, um, I met him, um, I learned about him from one of these, um, collection, cartoonist collections that Ted Rawl did. And uh, he's one of the first cartoonists I met on Facebook, but I like him just because of his quirky style and stuff. And the fact that I like to do cross hatching and he likes to do cross hatching too. But I, I like his kind of, um, 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 the different take that he takes on, um, on uh, is different issues. So, uh, yeah, so. Great. Right. Give it up for Angelo. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good job. So, so you know, this is uh, interesting. And when we were, you know, in the introduction, we talked about 2020 being a crazy year. And of course, for the Americans, they think America, which has got other stuff going on. And it's often hard to look outside our borders to see that everywhere around the world, this is also the craziest year ever. And yeah. the Philippines, like other countries, have had autocratic um, leaders, very much in the vein of Donald Trump, you know, populist usually conservative. Um, they're having all sorts of issues as well. And Philippines, one of the ones that jumps to the top of people's attention. And it's so curious that here you are in San Francisco, you're doing cartoons about Phil the Philippines. Uh, I'm curious about the kind of the challenges that that brings for you trying to do that. Well, you know, it's, I mean, I've only been in the Philippines one month my entire life. So at first I had, when I first started doing the Philippines, I had to do a lot of research and stuff. I, I was, you know, I was pestering my parents about issues and stuff. And um, I think I just learned a lot just from reading and stuff. But, you know, I met some cartoonists in the Philippines through Facebook and, you know, they don't feel safe, but in the San Francisco Bay Area, I feel pretty safe. I don't have to worry about getting killed. So I can be a little bit braver than them and stuff. I think, you know, one of the things I work in a weekly. And so I, I have to make sure that, you know, the, the cartoons that are relevant this week will be relevant, the, you know, the week that is published. So I think that's one of the challenges. And I think the other challenge is just making sure I get things right. Mm. So I talk to activists sometimes, but after I talk to activists, um, I fact check to make sure that, you know, it, with different sources to make sure that what I'm learning is right and stuff, so. Mm. Any other questions anybody have for, for Angelo? Angelo, I, I love your cross-hatching technique and your unique style. Is there any particular reason why you don't use color that often or is that, is that a purposely to do that? I mean, sometimes black and white can be very powerful, powerful and impactful. Um, but I'm just curious about the, the color thing. Yeah, I, I think it's just the publishers don't 
have color <laughs> in their, oh. in their <laughs> I would love to do color and stuff. It's just um, the editor. Um, I, actually, I never asked. You know, I've, I've been in the um, I've been in that paper for what eight years, and I, I just it's, I just have always assumed that I can't do color, but I've never asked them if I should. And stuff. So yeah, but I'll, 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 I will send this video to them and I'll ask them if I should. Do color. Actually, just just ask Dave to call him. He's your man. He's your agent, right? The black and white works. Absolutely. Give this guy color. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, um, so we're going to move on to Dave. You're next. However, however, I realize I made a mistake that I never. Uh, actually introduce Jen Sorensen properly. I didn't give your bio for people. So day before you, I'm going to introduce Jen. And I want to make sure the audience knows that you're not Jen. Okay, you're going to get your own introduction. But so Jen Sorensen, um, cartoons appear in the Nib, Daily Costs, The Nation, Politico, and alternative news weeklies around the US. She was the winner of the 2014 Herblot Prize and the 2017 Pulitzer Prize finalist. In 2021, Jen will serve as president of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists. Her cartoons are impressive, but this is even more impressive. So thanks, Jen. So right, now, thanks, Dave, you, now we're on to Dave. So Dave, David Brown. David Brown is an NAACP Image Award winning artist, educator, and publisher, uh, as well as a producer of cartoons, graphic novels, and comic books. He is the political cartoonist for the Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper and recipient of multiple prestigious merit awards for best editorial cartoon from the National Newspaper Publishers Association. His book, Obama, Race and the Media, Drawing My Own Conclusions, was awarded an NAACP Image Award in 2009. He's a member of the board uh, on the board of director of the Museum of African American Art in Los Angeles and served on the board of the director, directors for the AAC, the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists. Welcome, Dave. Let me get your cartoons up here, mate. Okay. All right, get my screen going here yet again and see if we can click forward. Here we go. Okay, so I work for the Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper. And so one of the things I try to do with my cartoons is inspire, educate, and motivate because my primary audience is African-American. So I try to be the voice for folks that don't have a voice. So this particular cartoon deals with how Donald Trump views protesters. So uh, Black Lives Matter, they're troublemakers. Okay. But, you know, the white supremacists, they're very fond people. So I'm just trying to show the contrast between uh, the way they're viewed and, and sometimes even through the media. Okay, so this is pretty much self-explanatory just in terms of the division in this country and, and what our values are and just showing some contract, contrast and irony in, in our society. And America first, <laughs> we're first in the coronavirus deaths, we're first in wealth and inequality, racism and discrimination and healthcare. So just, just I, cause I really think that the coronavirus really has um, unveiled a lot of the inequities in America. And I think our leader in chief, you know, is certainly made that more prevalent or actually more obvious, let me put it that way. So, you know, besides, you know, dealing with political issues, I also like to use this platform as a way to educate, uh, you know, people in the, in the community. And in this case, <clears throat> you know, uh, Vaping is, is big, especially uh, among young people. So I wanted to do something to raise awareness of, you know, of vaping and the uses of it. And it's just as dangerous as cigarettes. So this is a cartoon by a guy by the name of Rod Cobb. He just recently passed away. He's more um, known for being a concept designer, 
Uh, he did work for E.T., Raise the Lock, Ark, Alien, Back to the Future, and Star Wars. But he also did political cartoons for the L.A. Free Press, uh, you know, like in the 60s. And I, I like this cartoon. I mean, I think what makes a powerful cartoon when you can look at it and it sends a very powerful message without even no dialogue, nothing. And so um, he has a really powerful way of uh, conveying, you know, uh, the irony in this particular situation. All right, Dave, thanks so much. Give it up for Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. And also, Ron Cobb was a great influence for me as well. He's an Australian, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, he's Australian. Australian cartoonist. So, so Dave, this has been a, a you know a historic year in in the, around the issue of racial justice. And I'm curious for you, what has been the some of the challenges of operating with this you know very powerful um, subject out there and tackling it and you know, you talked yourself about yourself being an educator and you spent a lot of time out in the community talking to folks. I do. Um, tell me about what it's been like for you to operate in this year, in this year. Well, you know, what's really interesting is that, you know, I've been doing this since, you know, since I started doing cartoon and I worked as a teacher. I, I did an after school program for a number of years in South Central Los Angeles. I've had an art program in the juvenile halls. And, but what's interesting about this year, I really feel like it's a tipping point, you know, uh, and this may really have some real traction, uh, not unlike in the past where it feels like, you know, it's just that the people in the black community that realize there's these inequities. And what's interesting is, um, you know, I just retired from teaching. You know, I was teaching, I taught for about 11 years for the, the, the school district. Los Angeles School District. And I remember, and I was the only African American on staff. I teach design, I teach animation. And it was, it was really interesting how folks felt like this, this, this racial thing was something new. You know, like, oh, David, how are you handling that? George Floyd, this is, I was for that. I was like, you know, I've dealt with this all my life as a black man in America. So it's, so it's nothing new. What's different about it is I think, you know, other ethnicities are really realize what's going on. And, and I think part of it probably because of the pandemic, everyone's sitting, sitting at home watching TV and what do they see? They either, they either listen to Trump or they see in, you know, some of this, the, the George Floyd's death was horrible. And it was like, you know, and, and, I, and I think that um, the thing that I'm optimistic about is that maybe this will be, you know, a tipping point where there will be real change. Great. So, um, well, let's move on. Thanks, Dave, by the way. Uh, really great. Well, we're looking forward to furthering that conversation. Um, we're going to go to Eric Garcia. You're up next, buddy. And Eric, I love the way that you write your bio, guys. Pay attention to this bio, really well done. So it starts off, Eric Garcia started creating political cartoons while in the US Air Force. At first it was to poke fun of officers, but later evolved into sat satirizing his job and the military itself. One of the few Ch Chicano political cartoonists, Garcia has unique perspective that offers new ways of visual visually and intellectually examining world affairs. This Chicano perspective offers a critical vision of the often misguided, quote unquote, American dream. If you're looking for funny punchlines, uh, Garcia's cartoons are not for you. But if you want to pull down Uncle Sam's pants and see what's really going on, look no further. Garcia's weekly series, El Machete Illustrated, is black and white, one panel critique that shreds conservatives and disembowels liberals wherever hypocrisy lurks the machete strikes. Well done, Eric. So let me get, call up your cartoons here. And we will, and one more bit here. And take it away, Eric. Yeah, and so what I did, I did uh, a little, something a little bit different. I put two uh, cartoonists that I'm looking at, that I, I'm always looking at, but I, that I wanted to, uh, to highlight. And then I'm going to show a couple of mine at, towards the end. 
So this first one is is of uh, you know Angela Lopez. Um, I often look at his work to see what's going on in the Philippine, Philippines and seeing what's what's going on with that community. And I love cartoons that deal with historical, um, that, that give some historical background so people understand what's happening in the present. And this perfectly exam uh, exemplifies what, what I'm talking about. We have this Asian American walking down the sidewalk and as she's walking, all the different steps that she's, she's uh, uh, moving forward over are different um, things that are different races and, and, and prejudice uh, 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 situations that have happened in US history. So we have the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Watsonville riots, Japanese American internment camps, uh, Vincent Chin, 9-11. Now we have COVID, she's about to step out. So all these are different racist uh, uh, movements that have and are, have it, are happening against uh, the Asian uh, community uh, here in the United States. And I, and I, and I think this exemplifies really good the past and the present uh, is a good example of a cartoon that does that the next uh, cartoon is um uh ooh. is that the right one no i, I was going to put up jen source and the next oh, okay one. yeah that one there you go so jen you know <laughs> uh, another cartoon is i admire and i really liked uh that what she had said previously about taking some of these um, important issues that get buried from all the, the other tragedy that's happening amongst us. And one of them is war. You know, people don't realize we're still at war right now in many different places around the world. Unfortunately, the United States foreign policy takes us all over the world and continues to get us bogged down in these horrible situations that not affect, not only affect uh, people around the world, but us in multiple ways. And this little diagram that Source and put together is a perfect example of how we get in, in, uh, embedded in these different messes. So the, the, the first, it's a little cycle and it goes round and round. The first part of the cycle is these war hawks telling, telling everyone, telling the public how it's going to be a splendid little war. And then we have these 9-11 these, uh, falsely invoked, um, you know, the, the justification that, that the, these wars are justified because of the because they were somewhere somehow involved with 9-11 tragedy. And then it goes down to like these talking heads who, 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 are, who are spreading this message of war uh, via uh, social media or what have you. And then we have uh, the anti-war activists that are being ignored. Then we have uh, step five is the super patriots who, who, um, who, who has this bumper sticker says, if you're not if you're not supporting the troops, then you're a traitor, right? If you're against the war, then you're a traitor to your country. And then we have um, these political analysis trying to figure out, you know, what happened? Well, how come we're in this this mess? And uh, and then we have these these other people, these other citizens talking about, you know, you know, uh, we're in this mess again. The conventional wisdom from forms that war has a mistake, but no one. Uh, held accountable, like no one's held accountable. And then it just goes on in a complete circle. So I, I like these, this cartoon because it brings uh, back the point that we, we are embedded in some very disastrous things around the world and people often forget about it because it's happening in some foreign nation, it's happening in a different country. So it, it doesn't uh, personally affect you, even though it, it, it does, it does, right? So I like these cartoons. So. The next one was, um, again, with for our foreign policy, uh, because our foreign policy creates such chaos and havoc in these foreign mm -hmm. countries, we, we, we should take note of the root of the cause of immigration to the United States, because these wars cause chaos and instability, uh, economically, politically, civil unrest that causes people to flee their homes. People don't want to leave their homes. People are forced to leave their homes. And unfortunately, with the United States immigration policy, now these ICE detention camps are overrun with refugees, with people fleeing their homes. And in these detention camps, COVID is running rampant. Now the United States response to this is to keep these, uh, to, to, uh, to not respond to the medical needs of these people in detention camps and to export these people, export the corroded virus back to the countries and causing the pandemic to, to further explode. So it's, it's pure evil. And then why are we embedded in these foreign poli foreign policies, these foreign uh, tragedies, these, these foreign wars, when the actual war, the actual battles right here, here in the United States. 
right in our in our in the, in the middle of the, the country at Fort Hood, Texas, there has been more military personnel killed at Fort Hood, Texas through homicides than through war zone activity. And uh, we, we uh, just, you know, past couple of months ago, uh, Vanessa Guillan was, was the latest tragic uh, military personnel who, who was tragically killed and sexually harassed in the military. So the war is not overseas, it's actually right here at home. And the last cartoon is, is dealing with, again, with the, the, the for, <clears throat> foreign policy or foreign uh, uh, ways of new uh, colonialism, of, of, uh, of capitalism that are at the, again, talking about what are the roots causes of these, these tragedies that affect all uh, industry and, and capitalism encroaching into these uh, uh, environments that never had human contact and what's happening. The environment is reacting and causing uh, 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 these different diseases and different animals to come out from these habitats who had never been in contact previously. And COVID-19 uh, is one of them. And possibly there could be a COVID-20 in the future if we still encroach on, still encroach on these environments that, um, that have uh, dire consequences to, to um, destroying uh, natural habitats and to, and, and it's the irony is that the pharma, the medical industry is, is, is uh, actually, their mouths are watering because of all the different ways and possibilities to, to capitalize, not only on the destruction of the environment, but all the, and trying to analyze and trying to create antidotes for all these di different diseases that are, that are now plaguing our, our, uh, our world. Like, yeah, come on, get, guys, give it up for Eric. <laughs> so, so, uh, what why I love these kind of round table things is that in addition to what, what, seeing people's work, you get to hear their words and what um, you could tell, listen to you, Eric, is the same that Jen had mentioned earlier, passion, passion being an important part of what you do. And your cartoons are very passionate. You can see they're strong. They've got a tremendous energy. But when you hear you talk about it, you get a sense of where that energy comes from because you clearly feel real passionately about these issues um you know what um what is it like for you to take that passion and try to get it onto paper well i think that's where all my energy goes to I, i've been i've been told i'm a, I'm a very nice pessimist because <laughs> all, all my my negative energy goes towards the, the artwork itself so i'm i'm pretty mellow self uh mild-mannered person generally <laughs> but my artwork comes out totally different that's funny. Isn't that funny? Well, we're going to go straight on the past so that give us ourselves plenty of time to um, chat with everyone. I'm going to, we're going to close out this round with Pat Bagley, who is the, this is a great quote. Pat is the longest continuously employed full-time editorial cartoonist in America, having created over 10,000 cartoons in his 40 year career with the Salt Lake Tribune with one newspaper. His work is syndicated around the globe. He has won dozens of awards, including finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Pat, uh, let me uh, get your stuff on screen here, and then yeah. we're gonna let you take it away here. Oh, all right, go ahead, Pat. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I think you can draw a bright line between the establishment of Fox News and the erosion of trust and faith in our national institutions. I mean, they started out as being, you know, fair and balanced, which is just baloney. Um, but they, 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 it's just, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's just a cesspool of lies and misinformation. Um, that's Fox News. Okay, here's time where Greta won the person of the year from Time Magazine, and all that Trump could do about it was rage, rage tweet. Uh, but the thing is, she's got the facts. She's got the science on her side. We have a president who doesn't believe in facts, doesn't believe in science. I did this a couple of days ago. This is the only ID check Trump poll watchers are entitled to. And this woman is flipping off this Trump poll watcher with the bird. And this is one of those things that we as cartoonists have to deal with. You know, how do you show somebody flipping the bird without actually flipping the bird? Because I work for a family newspaper. Um, but so you do that little black 
thing that kind of covers it up. And here's something that I just find so fascinating is that we are in the middle of a recession, the worst recession since 1928 by any measure, by, 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 you know, you look at anything and this is worse than anything and still Wall Street is hitting new highs. Um, and I think they're delusional. Okay, this is <laughs> my friend, Mike Peters. And I chose this cartoon because he did this when I barely started cartooning, but this is, he was one of my heroes. He was one of my people that I looked to. And it's because he did a cartoon 40 years ago that is still, that is still, uh, uh, you know, relevant. Okay, this big oil. You want coal? We own the mines. You want oil and gas? We own the wells. You want nuclear energy? We own the uranium. You want solar power? We own the uh, Solar power isn't feasible. <laughs> I mean, still a great cartoon, right? <laughs> still a great cartoon. Pat, give it up for Pat, guys. Come on. Rouse Thanks. it. This is a sitting ovation, Pat. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so, Pat, one of the things that um, our viewers out there may not fully understand is uh, Pat's um, impact and value to the community in the Salt Lake area. Because everyone, I guess, can imagine uh, Utah is a conservative state. It's a you know, red state, very conservative. Um, Salt Lake City, generally, pretty conservative. Pat, I, I'm not sure I would describe you as conservative. How would you describe yourself? <laughs> well, I got... I got radicalized during the George W. Bush administration <laughs> when they lied us into a war and they lied about everything. And since then, I got to say, they've been lying about everything. They've been lying about COVID. They've been lying about taxes. They've been everything. So it was an easy choice for me. Uh, now, what, now, I understand too, Pat, that you are um, recently you did a cartoon that actually created a big protest even, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, it was a cartoon suggesting that there is white supremacists who are infiltrating uh, policing in America. And I thought about it a, a lot because it's a really touchy issue. And so I depicted the racism as an affliction of policing. I didn't say that police were racist. I said, this is an affliction that, that is going on. And um, certain police agencies here in Utah took it the wrong way. They deliberately misinterpreted what I was trying to say. And they said, Pat Bagley saying that all police are racist. And that's exactly what I, I, I tried not to depict. Um, but they had, a, they had a protest. They had an anti-Pat Bagley protest. Yeah. And uh, about 40, 50 people showed up. And then I, find, then I found out the person who, um, who, 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 who sponsored the protest is also sponsoring anti-mask rallies here in Utah. Oh, nice. So if I'm defined by... My opponents, I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. Imagine what they would say if you drew your cartoons on a mask, how bad they would they'd protest that. That would be really bad. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> um, so now I, I, I brought a, a little broad conversation just amongst ourselves a little bit, and then we're going to invite um, everybody else to join, join in. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that um, uh, I was wondering, folks, is that uh, you know, we have really di diverse uh, audiences that you guys have been, have been addressing. Um, and this year with all these crazy um, things going on, I'm curious whether there was, um, or how this year compares to all other years you've ever been involved in this business. Angela, you got something to say? No, no, I'm, I'm just thinking and stuff. But I mean, you know, it, it's been crazy and stuff. But, you know, I, I think for me, because of what's happening in the Philippines, I'm actually just kind of scared and stuff because, you um, the more stuff that's, that Duterte has been doing, the more scared I've been getting and stuff. But um, in terms of it being different and stuff, I think Duterte has been using the COVID-19 pandemic as an excuse to be even more authoritarian than before and stuff. So, and I'm, I'm always worried about what I'm going to read next week. And uh, when I read that 80% uh, of uh, Filipinos support Duterte, I keep, you know, for the past four years, I keep thinking, why aren't they seeing what I'm seeing? and stuff and that kind of scares me and stuff but you know um you know i think it's it, it's it's just uh for the past four years it's an increasing fear mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. so 
Well, know, for me, yeah, Dave, I was going to turn to you because he, he talks about fear, but you're about hope, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but this year is different because it seems like it's more polarized. People either love it or they hate it. You know, it's, it's like it's like people are, are taking sides. You know, like the, like the community work things that that represent people of color and, and 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 a voice for them. You know, I get lots of praise for that, and then you get these trolls. People, you know that that well. You know, all lives matter. You know, I'm so I just find it's it's even more polarizing than it's been in the past. I think it's been harder to be in our business in general, partly because of that. I mean, the, thin, the skins are thinner and the fuses yeah. are shorter than it's certainly been ever in my collective uh, years uh, doing this business. And uh, but it's also where and you guys correct me if I'm wrong here, where we feel that what we do also matters more than ever before. Now, in some ways, you know, newspapers are re, re, you know, declining. There's you know fewer and fewer people are dealing with them. Our images and our pictures are appearing, however, in more and more um, yeah. people's eyeballs because of the web and so on. And uh, the 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 cost and the and the desires of to get things right uh, is on the tips of everyone's tongue. So we we are basically engaged in a really important conversation, historic conversation, on so many different subjects. So I feel that the cartoonists, this is this, you know, this is the time we've been waiting for. We we join this game, mm -hmm. you know, when we're teenagers and say, oh man, I'd love to be a cartoonist. We we join this game for this kind of moment. Yeah. And uh, you know, and you guys have raised your game to that, Jen. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. In, in that even as newspapers are struggling more than ever, I have received just an outpouring of gratitude from readers more than ever. Mm -hmm. And especially, uh, I think once once COVID uh, kicked off, like I got just a ton more subscribers and, and just way more email from people just uh, begging me to keep going, you know, and like I had someone even just like send a check to a newspaper to pass it on to me and like <laughs> that never used to, never used to happen. Um, so and that really does keep me going because honestly, there are some weeks where the news is so awful. I really, it's just, it's such a struggle to get into a frame of mind where you're writing jokes, you know? And I, I'm, I was going to ask you all, you know, have you struggled with this where the news is just so horrendous and you feel this responsibility, you know, to like translate it into something witty, but it, it is, you know, that for me has been the biggest challenge of this year. Mm. Yeah, Eric, I think what are you going to say? I think it's been a little overwhelming that there's there's so much going on that I just can't keep up with. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, uh, to back to the to what, that, that previous conversation about getting your your work out there. I think it's we we live in a time where we have so many different platforms for our work to be out there through social media. But at the same time, I'm scared that my art artwork is only reaching a certain population. That the algorithm, algorithm, excuse me, algorithms only allow you to absorb, right? So there's, yeah. Um, I, I'm worried that my cartoons are only going to a certain population versus when it, it's published in a, in a newspaper, anyone could pick it up, you know. Mm. Um, so that's my big worry right now that I'm not reaching the population that maybe that that uh, the different populations that I I want reaction from or I want to teach something to. That's that's one of my scares right now. Mm -hmm. so, so we're talking about polarization and that assumes that both sides are kind of equal but that's not true i mean the polarization now is truth versus lies mm -hmm. i mean we had um trump's white house doctor explain what was going on with them and i knew i was not going to get the truth i was not going to get the facts um and that's been clear that's, that's been their their <laughs> modus operandi for the last four years is just to bs um and you know everybody says, well, all politicians lie. That's not true. That's not true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, truth is important. Even conservative political cartoonists, a lot of them really hate Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, I could name a dozen right now, um, and ones who like him are a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that we've—I'm sure all of you have had this experience where somebody in the public meets you and you say, "I or oh, I am a cartoon. You're a cartoonist." you must be having such a great time right now. And the fact is 
that it's more difficult than people think it is. First of all, I think there's an element that Jenny, you mentioned that, you know, it, this is trying, trying to get your brain wrapped around all this madness that's going on out there. But also in the web with the memes everywhere and, uh, and also the topical jokes taken by the you know, late night comedians means that the low hanging fruit, the obvious metaphors, the obvious jokes are all being taken. So for us to be, re to be observed and watched and even taken seriously, we have to be a step above the kind of the general stuff that's out there. Um, does, that, is, does that resonate with you guys at all? Yeah, I think, I think Trump is, like you're saying, low hanging fruit. There's, there's hundreds of political cartoonists that are stabbing uh, Trump you know, every day with their pencils. And it's, uh, I've, I've actually stepped back, trying not to, to focus so much on him because there's so many other important issues He's just a distraction for behind the scenes of all the other dastardly deeds that are going on. So it, that's that's how, how I try to maneuver around that. You know, I, I've had that same challenge where I went to a point where I just didn't want to do any Trump cartoons for like a period of time. And the other challenge for me, too, is where do you find the hope? You know, where do you find the positive things? Like you, like you mentioned, Jen, you, you, you want to be able to make it uplifting and optimistic, you know, and, and, and not always be like, you know, negative. And so to, to me, that's the really big challenge, especially for like the next generation. I mean, I have grandkids. How do I inspire them that, you know, what kind of world, you know, are we gonna leave them? Well, well one, of our, one of our viewers out there passed on a question kind of the same, and Dave Scott asks, you all must spend hours exposed to various news mediums to do your work. Um, how and what do you do to maintain your sanity? Now, for me, I guess it's drawing cartoons. Oh, it's besides cartoons, I mean, what do you guys do to maintain your sanity? Is there anything else? You go I for walks? I hike. I hike. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I just try to limit how many issues I do just so I don't get overwhelmed. Because I know in the beginning, at the first couple of months of the Trump administration, every day was, was you know, I would, I would be depressed about one thing and then, you know, when I came home from work, I, you know, my neighbor would always tell me, oh, did you hear about Trump? And I would assume it was the previous days, you know, thing. And, but it wound up being something totally new that I hadn't heard yet. And I think after the first three months, I was really depressed. So I, I kind of, for me, I just try to focus on a, a few issues at a time so I don't get overwhelmed and stuff. Because I, I tend to get depressed if I don't and stuff. Well, well, we have another question. This one's from an anonymous attendee, which says, when writing cartoons, what measures do you take to ensure that you're not in unintentionally speaking over marginalized voices or stereotyping? Mm -hmm. I know that stereotyping, because cartoons usually deal in simplistic images, stereotyping can easily roll in. Um, I'm just curious about you guys, the way that you grapple with and maybe some of the answers you have for stereotyping. Eric, I'm going to start well, with you because your cartoons are quite strong and, and obviously you you are dealing with the, Ch with the Chicano perspective. It's it's hard not to stereotype. It's, it's, it's a challenge to not try to generalize a population into an icon. So that's the challenge. That's the, the trick of working and dealing with uh, cultural, uh, you know, people of color issues. Um, but I, I think there, there, there is a way to maneuver from within. Um, um, part of it is, is doing your research beforehand mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and making sure things are accurate, things are historically accurate. And, you know, that's, that's the reason why we have, you know, people uh, fact checking ourselves. My editor, my personal editor is my wife. I send her my cartoons and I say, you know, I give her, give me a cold read. Does this make sense? Is it offensive? Would other people think, it, think this is offensive? And if it's not what I'm looking for, it's not what I'm going for. If it's, it's hurting, if it's, if it's hurting instead of helping, then I, I can't use it. You know, I, I think uh, we need people to also look over our back and make sure that we're not doing destructive work and actually do. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, what we do is we're supposed to be punching up at the powerful. And if we're punching down at the powerless, then you got to think about where your priorities are. Um, you know, we are taking down the people who have the power, who have the money, who have the influence. But if you're going after people who have none of that, you're probably not doing the right thing. 
Well, you know, I like you, Eric, I, I have a group of a focus group of people that are close to me, family, friends, and uh, that I usually run ideas by them to see, you know, in, in terms of, because uh, sometimes you have an idea that can be interpreted differently. Uh, i give you an example. Um, I remember I did a cartoon about the swine flu. This was some time ago, right? So I did a picture of this family of pigs coming to the United States, swine flu, right? And so that was interpreted negatively as if I was saying, you know, Mexicans were pigs. So, but, but you know, I had to look at it from a different perspective. So, so in terms of just what you might, your intention versus how it might be interpreted. Right. You have to be careful in that, that fine line. So we've got a, a couple of more questions I think we can get in bef before our, our fabulous time is up here. Uh, one person, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask one of you guys to volunteer for this. Um, could any of you describe your thought processes for visualizing cartoons? Um, this person, Mike Dooley, specifically says about Trump news, but we kind of talked around that we often try to avoid Trump news, but just in the general visualization. Um, can you walk us through your, your process a little bit? Um, Pat, do you mind if I point that one at you? Because you know, you, you, you're a, a man with 10,000 ideas. <laughs> so uh, every, every, I mean, I've been doing this for over 40 years and every day it's a, it's a tightrope walk. I have no idea what I'll be doing or how I'll do it. Um, but I, you know, listen to the news and I think what outrages me the most. And then I think, okay, that's the subject. What am I going to say about it? And then I have to sit down and start to doodle. And sometimes something comes up. Sometimes you make it sound so easy. <laughs> <laughs> he just doodles and it comes out. Come on, I mean, put on. I mean, look, you, you, you also know that you're having an internal dialogue in your head about what's the important issues and how to approach it, and and what's a clever way to to bring it forward to make it engaging for okay. the audience. Okay, absolutely. And Eric brought up something very important: is you have to have an editor. You've got to have somebody that you can show your stuff to. And say I don't get you know, I don't get it. <laughs> What's this about? Um, everybody needs an editor. Well, I've got one question, and we got two minutes, so I'm going to throw this out. This is from John Ochter, who says, "For those of you doing just one cartoon a week, and there's several of us here, how close do you work to deadline to make sure, as best you can, that you draw <laughs> is re drawing is re relevant to the readers when they see it? So, how close do you work to deadlines, uh, Jen? How close do you work uh to deadlines?" Well, this is a perfect question for me. Um, basically, I work right up to deadline. I mean, I guess the first place my cartoon appears is Daily Co's at, uh, you know, like six in the morning. And so I am often up late. This is on Tuesday mornings. So I'm often up late Monday night, you know, typically till about 2 a.m. maybe. And uh, I, uh, so in that, in that way, procrastination is, is kind of a benefit in that I'm always, you know, very like, you know, <laughs> up to the moment in terms of news and I can make last minute changes. But um, yeah, it's been sort of a life goal to, <laughs> to get more ahead than that. But so far it, that, that I've not achieved that goal. Well, well cartoon deadlines are, are, are friends and enemies for all, uh, all of us. And it reminds me of a joke uh, from the UK. I lived in England for 11 years, drew cartoons over there for that entire time. And the, and the cartoonist joke was never go to the pub with a cartoonist because they will always <laughs> wait till one minute before closing time before they offer to buy you a drink because we love uh, deadlines. And that's the way yes. we got right. But with that, we are actually just meeting our deadline right now to finish the 60 minutes of our, of our chat here. It was such a delight um, to see all of your work and get to know your work a little bit better. And also hearing the voices behind the work is so uh, rel relevatory and, and so much fun in this crazy year. So I know that you guys are going to be doing some tremendous work in, in the months ahead. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And I'm going to pass the, our, uh, our torch over to the folks at uh, CXC and thank everyone for, for joining us during this time. Thanks a lot, Cal. Good to see you all. Thank, all right. you. thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, if we get a round of applause for our panelists.
And you can find out more about them on cartooncrossroadscolumbus.org. You can follow the links to their bios there. But thanks again, everybody.